Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the EO Cafe. This is a very, uh, very unusual EO Cafe. It's the first time that it hasn't been done from, well, from my office. Um, I'm in ESA, sitting next to Chris. So it's, um, it's unusual in that it's the uh, first time I'm with a guest. So we have, uh, have, have the two of us on the screen. So hopefully that's going to work quite well. It's a first because this is actually the first time I've traveled since um, February 2020. So it's, that's also a, a first, especially for, for me. So uh, let's see um, what, we, what we can do. We've still got a satellite in the background, you'll notice. Uh, ESA have managed to, uh, to rustle up a satellite. Unfortunately, we couldn't move one of the big models from just outside. That would have been really impressive. But uh, we've got a, you know, a real model of a satellite, not Lego, it's real. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, unusual um, EO Cafe, but it's, it should be a good one. So um, just a normal reminder of the rules, um, please. Uh, keep your microphones muted unless uh, I've asked you to, to, to join and join the conversation. Um, you're very welcome to leave cameras on. It's always good to see people, um, but that's up to you. And use the uh, chat to put any questions. If you can put any questions in there, then we can anticipate, we can see what's coming and, uh, and, and respond better. But um, I will ask you to pose the question yourself in your own words. So we're here to talk about global development assistance and the, uh, the program that ESA have in place for um, supporting industry and accessing uh, development finance within the IFI sector. Um, the, I think we would all agree, the European industry has a, a lot of capability, um, but export markets are very, very important. And um, we know from our survey that governments generally make up 50% or even slightly more of the market. Um, and this is particularly significant in export markets because accessing government markets outside own home base will normally require uh, support from your own government. So uh, experience from uh, Mark, my, my own experience uh, in this really, really uh, important, this type of program that the um, European institutional actor, in this case, ESA, is able to help the industry um, access what are essentially new markets. Um, it's hard for large companies. Uh, I know there, I've, I've been there, I've done that. Um, but for small companies, it's even harder. So again, this uh, program and this way of working really, really is important. So, um, on that basis, I'm very pleased. I'm with Chris, Chris Albrecht from, from ESA. Um, we have Alex Chune in Washington, who's uh, working with ESA at the World Bank. And um, Paolo Manunta, who's not in Manila, but normally will be in Manila, um, working with the ADB. And let me ask each in turn just to introduce themselves and just say a few, a few words about themselves. Chris? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So um, first of all, welcome to, to ESA. Uh, it's actually quite nice. I see also Stephen Coulson here uh, joined us and turned on his camera. So uh, very nice to have the uh, kind of, uh, you know, brain of, of the previous activities we implemented with the banks here also joining us today. So I'm Chris. Uh, I manage the GDA program at ESA, Global Development Assistance Program. The GDA program is actually, uh, you know, a follow up to a series of, of precursor initiatives uh, in engaging with development uh, finance institutions. And Alex actually will give you a bit of a context on how GDA is positioned and, and, and where this also came from. So I won't dive in more details here. Um, in fact, this EO Cafe is also in a sense linked to a specific activity in GDA. We have actually a programmatic support uh, activity on monitoring the evaluation uh, of the impact we, we hopefully generate. Uh, and part of that impact we hope to generate is positioning the European industry in easier accessing development finance and procurements from the banks. So we are gonna talk about this today and uh, I'll uh, leave it to Alex and Paolo, our two uh, representatives 
to provide you the details and then in the Q&A session or a wrap up, uh, I, I will make a little, a little bit more um, context or provide a little bit more context on uh, where we aim to go uh, with this activity. Okay, thanks, thanks, Chris. So, Alex, um, just uh, how about, about yourself and how you've ended up in in Washington, and then we'll ask Paolo the same. Sounds good. Hi everyone. So yeah, my name is Alex Chinet. I'm the European Space Agency representative to the World Bank. Um, I've, uh, I've been actually in this role for almost a year now uh, and will be still for the next uh, three years at least. That's a, that's a four years um, job, I would say. Um, before this, I was actually working at World Bank itself and also at AFD, mainly on the mainstreaming of Earth observation and geospatial data. And then so I designed the first strategy uh, of AFD, the French Development Agency, sorry for the acronym, uh, for the adoption and the uptake of our observation, and therefore I was in contact with us with, uh, with CNES. So this is kind of the follow up at the European level and with the World Bank, what I'm doing now. That's that, that, that's great, excellent, uh, excellent background. And of course, Chris was was the way you are now before. <laughs> so uh, we've got some good continuity, and uh, great that Steve's on the uh, on on the call. Paula, about yourself and how you ended up in uh, in Manila most of the time. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Paolo Manunda. I know some of you and some may not, which means uh, the, 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 the industry is very dynamic. Hopefully, you know, this, this is a very good indication. Uh, how did I find myself in Manila? Uh, I just wanted to have a challenge at some point in my life in 2017. Not that I did not have challenges before, but a different one in terms of location. And I've been joining uh, um, uh, under an ESA assignment, uh, the Europe is the the Asian Development Bank since June 2017. And although at the moment I'm not there, I'm still uh, associated with that. I've been uh, constantly in missions. Um, my uh, task is similar to the one of Alex. Uh, for ADB Choice, uh, um, they, they wanted us, they wanted me to be very close to the operations because that's where you know the real, uh, the real work is and sometimes it's challenging, but it's actually very exciting because we really see observation going into real use back to you back to you so we've 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 got a good audience to uh to hear about uh, this and your experiences and uh, how companies can maybe uh, access this now we've already had the advert for this so let's go go straight in um alex you were going to tell us a little bit about the the gda and uh, how it's how it's structured how it's working yeah exactly so i'm going to share uh, a few slides and my apologies, this first part is going to be slightly more top down than the usual Leo Cafe, but it's just so that everybody is on the same level uh, and, and has the same level of information. That, that's yeah. fine, that's fine, Alex. Okay, perfect. Great, uh, so can you see actually my, uh, yeah. Yeah. my presentation? All good? So um, as I was mentioning, my presentation will, will focus on the links between uh, development finance and Earth observation services. And I, I will start by giving you a quick snapshot of the development aid landscape, and then focus on the actual processes of, of what we call international financial institutions, which is really what we're interested in today. Uh, and more specifically, the World Bank and the, the Asian Development Bank. So just to start, first of all, I, I would like to clarify certain terms. Um, international development finance is actually closely linked to the broader concept called uh, development aid. And development aid, also called actually official development assistance, is all the funding or, or financing uh, that is provided by public actors from the most well-off countries uh, to improve living conditions in the least well-off countries. And this usually, uh, and, and since actually 2015, comes in the framework of the SDGs most of the time. So the, the question is who actually provides this development aid? Uh, we could divide those actors into uh, in two buckets. First, on the one hand, uh, on the left here, you have the, the, the bilateral donors. It's basically when development aid can go, goes directly from the donor country to the beneficiary country. Um, this is the case uh, of when Great Britain basically implements development aid projects and, and funding or financing through the FCDO, Germany with KFW, or France with, with AFD. And on the other hand, development aid can also take the form of contributions from states to the operating costs and programs of international organizations. And this is what we call multilateral aid. At the global level, the, the World Bank, the United States, the United Nations agencies and the European Union are, are the main players. At the regional level, we talk a lot about um, 
it, regional development banks like the IDB and the and the ADB. And finally, there are also what we call um, vertical funds, which focus on a particular problem, uh, like the Global Environment Facility and Adaptation Fund. So this is kind of the constellation of actors. Um, however, what we're interested in here is a specific type of actors, actually, uh, that we call international financial institutions. And the reason we're interested in them is that their way to deliver development aid is mainly based on financing schemes and, and mechanisms. Essentially, what we're talking about is, is the segmentation between grants-based development aid and soft loan-based development aid. Uh, and, and I'm going to come back to this uh, right after. And, and when you do this segmentation, you can actually redistribute those actors in two different groups. Uh, you have on the left side, the actors that operate mostly on grants. Uh, and with, for example, the United Nations, MCDO, and, and, and on, the la on the right side, you have those that operate mostly uh, based on soft loans. Soft loans are basically uh, concession, I mean, they are also called concessional loans, but they are basically loans that offer more generous terms than market loans. And one of the benefits of not only using grants, but also soft loans is the possibility of mobilizing much larger volumes of, uh, for investment, in infrastructure, or development policies. So the second set of actors on the right side um, is what we call and what I was referring to before as international financial institutions. And, and this is the group I'm going to focus on by giving you some more information about their uh, internal processes and how to access the, the potential procurement opportunities they could provide, which is really the, the interesting part uh, of today's EO Cafe for EO service providers. So the first, the first thing that is important for you uh, and that will make your life easier is that during the recent years, international financial institutions have made considerable progress in harmonizing their internal processes and policies. For example, almost all IFIs, um, IFIs being the acronym of international financial institutions, almost all of them use uh, what we call country strategy documents. And those are fundamental to establishing an IFI's lending priorities for a particular country based on the country's own vision for international development. And, and in discussion with the IFI, the document basically lays out the, the IFI support program for, for the nation and for the, for the coming years. Another important concept, and I think that will be one of the most important for you to, to remember today, is the concept of the project cycle. And the project cycle is basically the framework for the deployment and implementation of IFI's operations. Uh, in, the, in general, this project cycle is uh, built around the following steps. First, there is the identification, which is when an international financial institution and IFI and the borrowing country identify projects that are appropriate for the country's development strategy and, and suitable for IFI support, of course. Uh, the second step is the preparation. So basically, once once a project is, uh, is proposed and has entered the project pipeline, the borrower and the IFI technical staff study and define it further. And this is at the step that you have, for example, feasibility studies um, and and sometimes the elaboration of a master plan. Then comes the appraisal, which is essentially uh, IFI staff uh, conducting in-depth assessments of the technical, financial, and economic elements. Uh, after the appraisal, of course, negotiation and approval, because both parties, the IFI and the borrowing country or beneficiary country, have to agree on the exact terms of the loan. And uh, then the implementation. And, and I think one of the main message I want to convey here for everybody to remember, if you're not too familiar with this world of IFIs, is that it is important to understand that all IFI-funded projects are actually implemented by the borrowing country and not by the IFI providing the funds. Uh, therefore, implementation of the project, including procurement, uh, is the responsibility of the borrower and is carried out with minimal IFI assistance. And so, uh, in the end, most of the funds are actually being spent at this stage of implementation. And after the implementation, of course, uh, the potential evaluation to assess uh, how the project has performed. So you should also be aware, and that's important to, to remember too regarding this project cycle, that um, project cycles can actually often last for several years. And so being involved in a project from start to finish can re require a substantial long-term investment on your part. Uh, however, what, what is important and what you need to keep in mind is that the smaller components of this project cycle uh, can give um, access to specific shorter terms uh, procurement opportunities, right? 
Um, so coming back on those opportunities, actually, and, and the, the business opportunities for you, those can basically happen at different steps of the project cycle. Uh, during the identification phase, uh, the, the work that the IFI and the boring country do often builds on high-level countrywide or regional studies and assessments. And therefore, a this step represents a good opportunity for your service providers uh, to provide analytics or services to analyze trends at scale using available public imagery or geospatial data. Uh, then once a potential project is identified, <clears throat> the preparation stage is also often the moment during which more precise Earth observation data and more robust EO services are considered in order to inform the elaboration of master plans, uh, feasibility studies, project design, or, or potentially environmental and, and social impact assessments. Uh, during the implementation too, there will be potentially opportunities, but this will of course depend on, on the actual components of the loans. So some loans uh, will integrate, for example, capacity building components that could be focused on Earth's observation or also potentially spatial data infrastructures. So that could also be a way for you to link. And finally, for the evaluation steps, some teams, this is not yet mainstream, but more and more teams within IFIs are trying to use Earth observation, satellite imagery, and related data to better assess the impacts of their, um, of their operation. Uh, apart from those four steps that I think represent the where you have the largest opportunities, there is one last thing, which is a, another entry point. And this is actually the activities uh, that IFIs deploy regarding advisory services, technical assistance, and analytics. And those activities, which usually help a country to better uh, frame a policy or regulation, better understand what's happening, for example, in urbanization or in, in the sector of the forestry, can be deployed at any stage of the project cycle and can even be deployed when there is no project in the pipeline. So this is something to keep in mind because those smaller analytics pieces uh, that are elaborated by IFIs and delivered to boring countries also repre represent potential opportunities for your service providers. Um, I, now that I've, I've given you somehow the, the, the different steps of where your service providers could, could position themselves, I wanted to give you a few um, advice or recommendation. The, the first thing I would recommend is that as soon as you identify a project, you should review the project documents to identify the key decision makers. Uh, in, in the context of the country strategy documents, which I was mentioning before, this will really help you to monitor the progress of active projects and, and assess future developments, basically. The second uh, advice I can give you is really to build links with project officers. So all IFIs assign project officers to each project, and these individual, individuals serve as the managers and supervisors who implement the project on behalf of the IFI. So they, they, are, they are basically key contacts for seeking opportunities and getting more uh, precise information on the project. Third advice would be that if you're meeting with uh, those guys, the project officers, or even the borrowing countries, agencies, and stakeholders, it's really important for you to have a targeted approach because they are very busy people, they have limited time, and, and if you ask them uh, just general inquiries or try to show them your whole portfolio, usually this will not attract your, their attention. You really have to come in with, look, I have this service that could be applied to your project in this area for this purpose, and that's where you'll be able to kind of hook them. Um, that would be the, the best recommended approach, if I could say. And finally, also, that's something that is often present in the procurements as a requisite is uh, to build links with local partners. If you uh, if you are linked with local partners and, and that you can demonstrate that it's not only to have this on paper, but that the link with them actually makes sense in the service you're offering, um, that will really play in your favor and could potentially allow us to end up being the winner of the, of the, of the potential uh, tender you were applying to. So those would be the recommendation. Uh, now, actually, I, I wanted to dive a little bit more on apart from all all the things I've described to you that apply to all IFIs uh, on the World Bank itself, uh, considering the time uh, the ESA representative to the World Bank. So the World Bank is, is kind of unique in its nature and is characterized by uh, three main numbers. It, it has provided over 45.9 billion US dollars in financial assistance uh, since it, it started operating. It has delivered more than 12,000 projects and it is the most global development bank consider that, considering that it integrates 189 uh, member countries. 
the World Bank Group itself actually is divided in, in five different institutions. And what we'll be interested in here is more specifically the IBRD, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the IDF. This is the, the bar that is actually called the World Bank. The World Bank Group are the five institutions, and the World Bank with that group is the IBRD and IDA. And this is the, the, the those are the, the two institutions that operate um, based on those soft loans I was mentioning to you for investment in infrastructure or in development policies. Um, the World Bank then is, is actually divided in uh, global practices. It's, uh, it, it's a bit complex, but trying to simplify it, basically the global practices are kind of the sectoral segmentation in the portfolio of the World Bank. And you have also the, the cross-cutting solution areas that are uh, where some experts are, are hosted uh, to support people in the global practices. It's important for you to keep this in mind because most of the time, the global practices and the people you'll be uh, interacting with will be part and affiliated to a specific global practice, should it be water, transport, education, agriculture, and in each of those global practices, the profile of the uh, usual suspect or, or basically the average person that you will find in those GPs, which is the acronym of global practice, might differ. Right, uh, some will be filled with engineers. Some others will be filled with economists. You know that's uh, that, that's what you have to keep in mind. You will ne not necessarily face the same audience in all of those uh, in all of those units. Um, and so, in order to fulfill their objectives, every global practice is structured as follows: it has a global director. Below him are multiple practice managers with geographical, technical, or functional uh, remits, and then below. At the bottom, you, you have the actual uh, task team leaders, and those task team leaders are actually going to be your, your main contact points. Uh, they are basically the people I was referring to when describing the overall IFI landscape, the project officers. They, they, are, they are the ones that actually uh, work directly on the lending operations, which is the core of the World Bank work, and therefore this is mainly with them that you, you will be liaising and working. The challenge here is that the, the pool of task team leaders is very fragmented. So each of them somehow works on their own project, sometimes with rather limited coordination with their colleagues in their own practice. So the challenge for your providers is really to find the right entry points in order to learn about uh, potential procurement opportunities. So that's, that's, I would say, one of the main challenges. And therefore, as you might have understood until now, but the work of IFIs um, and their operational processes is rather complex. And that's why I wanted to start with this presentation, which is still a simplification, but gives you a good idea of what's happening. Um, and the, the, there is a huge untapped potential for the, for the adoption of and mainstreaming of observation. And this is the reason why the European Space Agency has been working with the World Bank for more than 10 years to promote the use and adoption of observation technologies and services. Th this collaboration has gone through different programs and steps. First, the world, which was about raising awareness. Second was EO4SD, about consolidating requirements. And then uh, the GDA program, which is the current program, which is really about mainstreaming and transferring Earth observation um, into operational processes and financing at the bank. So coming back quickly on the actual structure of the GDA program, which was launched in 2020, this program really seeks to achieve its objectives through thematic activities, which are the GDA 8 activities here at the core of the infographic, which are also supported by cross-cutting activities, including a knowledge hub, analytics platform, and Fastio co-financing facility. And the idea is all is that all those activities are coordinated with IFI funded capacity building and skills transfer, which is the, the blue uh the, the blue part of the infographic that you see here in order to generate uptake and adoption of earth observation and so li like the previous programs the gda program is implemented through the recruitment of eo consortia of companies which were given the mission to support world bank teams in the use and integration of eo so ultimately um the idea is that while promoting the broader use of earth observation at the world bank this collaboration we have with IFIs also allowed us to better position European expertise and in particular the companies that were selected in each activity. And you'll hear more about this with the uh, Terra Due and, and GAF experience in just after uh, I, I finish this presentation and after Paolo also describes a, uh, ADB. So maybe just two quick slides to finish. I hope I'm, I'm not too much over time. Uh, please do let me know if it's the case. Um, in order to illustrate the potential impacts of this collaboration between ESA and IFIs, I, I just wanted to show you a quick graph. Uh, the, the data I'm going to show you here is based on the text mining 
uh, analysis, analysis that uh, we have implemented and that analyzes the frequency of specific Earth observation related keywords in the project information documents at the World Bank. What you are going to see is that basically from 2000 to 2010, it was fairly stable. There were there was no uh, steep increase, but that after 2010 and especially since 2015, there was a considerable considerable and steep increase in the the, the reference and I would say the mention of Earth observation uh, in the project information documents. This overlaps pretty well with actually our programmatic approach and what I was describing to you just before, which shows that what we've been doing is bringing some fruits uh, and, and it's definitely increasing the use and adoption of Earth observation within those banks. That's nice for us, but what that means for you and the EO service providers is that, is that there is an increasing number of Earth observation related procurements that are being issued. And that's therefore a lot of potential for you to tap in. Um, Maybe the therefore the last message, and that's on on that World Bank specific specific is that coming back on this main message I conveyed to you, which is that the projects are being implemented by the borrowers and not the IFIs, but that the IFIs sometimes still intervene in the preparation phase. There is actually two sources of procurements when you deal with IFIs. There are the procurements that come from the borrowing countries because they need to implement a specific activity or component of the loan, and they are the one procuring. And there is, and, and this corresponds actually to the first platform I'm, I'm showing you here, the procurement notices platform that centralizes all this from borrowing countries' websites on the World Bank website. And then there is the eConsultant2 uh, platform, which is the World Bank executive procurements, uh, which is when the World Bank procures when, uh, with uh, companies to better prepare a project, to better monitor what's happening um, and on, on the ground or to evaluate potentially uh, a project. So it, it's, it would be good for you to keep an eye on both of those and keep in mind that the first one at the top uh, is related to procurements that are implemented by the, the actual borrowing countries. And the second one is World Bank executive procurements. You will actually have more information on how those platforms work, how you can register, have a vendor registration number um, through a webinar that will come and that is will be implemented by the GDA and any activity. Uh, this will be with the World Bank procurement specialist. So uh, you'll definitely be able to get more information on the specifics of, the, of those platforms later uh, in the year. That would be all on the main landscape and the World Bank side. So um, yeah, I can... Great. That's great, Alex. Now, um, make sure that we get you. You send us the link, and we will obviously uh, circulate that or add that as well. And uh, there's a nice chart showing the uh, the uptake of, of EO. Um, a, a number of questions coming from that, and that's a reminder to everyone on the call. If you've got questions, please put them into the chat, and we'll come to them later. But now, I'd like to um, to turn to Paolo, and. Um, how does that compare with what happens in the ADB? Are the processes similar? What's the, the ADB setting? Is there a similar uh, uh, ramp up of, of, of use? Paolo, please. Thanks, Jay. In terms of processes, actually, you know, pretty much the same, you know, like uh, uh, Alex illustrated, you know, the project cycle is exactly that. Uh, probably uh, depending on uh, on the project, sometime you know during uh, during the project implementation, at least for the first two years, um, um, the, the, the mission leader he, he, re he really gets more involved than uh, probably than uh, than you know than uh, than, he, than he should allow me to say. But it depends on the complexity of the project. But on uh, on a five year cycle project, usually the bank really really gets involved for the first two years. Um, in terms of uh, uh, differences, I don't see many differences, but there is one, uh, one, uh, one thing. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the private sector, you know, the private sector, uh, EDB is actually internal, you know, it's actually called PSOD. Just to understand what the private sector is, you know, the private sector is financing private operations, you know, really, uh, for example, um, constellation of satellites for, uh, for telecommunication that is actually handled inside the inside ADB by the PSOD departments. But let me throw uh, just, you know, two slides, a couple of numbers. Um, ADB uh, for 2021 uh, has dispersed 22.5 billions in loans and grants. 
Um, this one is suffering, of course, from COVID, although there was a big emphasis on COVID because the previous years, uh, the disbursement was about 30 billion. Uh, 230 million of technical assistance. This one is very important because this is where uh, the entry points are, you know, uh, even before waiting uh, for the loan to be in place, um, we, we need to be connected to technical assistance because the technical assistance is where you do try new things. And, uh, and among trying new things, you really try to make, uh, to make uh, the project more innovative. And that observation is among uh, one of the five preferred digital technologies for adoption in UV. Um, 12.9 million from co-financing partners as, um, you know, that, that's also an important number because those are always money which are given to the country in the loan. And it's not unusual that we see some uh, European faces there, you know, like AFD, a, a, you know, as for example, a lot of interest uh, in providing co-financing in Southeast Asia, something to keep in mind. Uh, final things in terms of members, uh, of course, uh, Asian Development Bank is a regional bank. 68 members, 49 in the region, and outside the region you do have, you know, uh, entities like um, countries like the US and many European countries, but not all the European countries. Uh, a little bit on the map, uh, whatever is in orange uh, are uh, countries that, you know, have, have been graduated, you know, or, or, you know, they're not eligible to receive funding. Uh, and, and, you know, they're in the region, they're a very important key player. What we need to be aware is that they offer a lot of technologies. Uh, some of you, of course, knows very well that some of them, you know, Japan, uh, Korea, Australia, have you know, sorts of uh, uh, space agencies. But this is not a problem because uh, thanks to the GDA uh, program, um, ESA is the only uh, space agency at the moment who has you know, a continuous uh, um, um, secondment program and, and a resource person allocation for, for the future. JAXA is also there, but JAXA at the moment has only a collaboration you know, from, from Manila to Tokyo, nothing in, uh, in, uh, in the building. And on top of that, uh, what is really important is the GDA program because they don't have a GDA program to demonstrate things. Uh, next slide, uh, Alex, please. Okay, uh, these colorful slides is really uh, to, to show you the priorities of the bank, because if we know the priorities of the bank, probably we know, you know, where best the Earth Observation Technology fits in. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, the priorities are something like, you know, uh, related to um, adaptation to climate change uh, and reduction of disaster and risk. Uh, this one is very important for the Earth Observation because what does it say is that, um, the demands for loans will always be uh, most likely you now for, uh, for uh, making uh, running waters in city, uh, building a new roads, for example, or build, building a seawalls. Uh, but having identified the priorities means that when you uh, disburse the loan, uh, the, the, the implementing the countries has to do things better than before. And of course, adaptation to climate change uh, uh, is, uh, is, you know, is, uh, is, uh, is a must. Um, how Earth Observation fits in the game? Uh, for example, we have some, some, some opportunities, some demonstrations, some examples in which uh, when there is a new design uh, uh, element of the infrastructure, that's where Earth Observation is actually built. I'd like to borrow you know, uh, one sentence from other colleagues in ADB that they say, let's build better. Uh, just a final note, uh, it's important to note that at the strategic level, um, the priorities of the bank match one-to-one -one, uh, the 70 sustainable development goals. Uh, it's highly political and highly, you know, considered, you know, to be evaluated, you know, during project implementation and design. I'll stop right there and uh, I'll give back the floor to, uh, to Jeff for navigating us. That's great, Paolo. Um, so, I mean, companies are getting involved in, um, in this. I, I, I was wondering if you were able to give any indication of the, the scale of the participation of, uh, of, of European companies. And then I think you've also got some one or two examples to, uh, to show us. Uh, I, I'm not sure, Alex or Paolo, who, uh, who wishes to respond? Alex? So, 
um, so you're asking basically about the, um, the role of European companies on... The, 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 yes, is there a strong participation now of European companies? You show about the opportunities. <clears throat> and, and I know some of the companies have been working with you, so just maybe a few words about, about that and the sorts of things that are going on with European companies. Sure. So the reality is that we... Um, the World Bank has been working historically, and it's also because it's HQ is in Washington uh, with a lot of American companies. Uh, but the good thing is that, and I guess ESA has been helping a lot with this, is that we were able to rebalance this a bit with European companies being able to, to find the right entry points and work with more and more uh, teams at the bank. There are specific sectors on which the the European companies are especially uh, well positioned and much better positioned than they used to be. Uh, potentially on, on urban topics or, or forestry. Um, I would not have the exact uh, percentage that European companies represent right now in the procurements. This is actually uh, potentially data that we're trying to, to analyze right now, uh, as we're, as, as you've seen, the, the, the figure I showed you was about project information documents, but we're basically trying to run the same analysis at the yeah. procurement level, knowing which procurements were attrib attributed and then, okay. and, and there's better understanding the picture, right? The, the larger picture. But that would be the main message I could convey to you. And I think that in order to, to get a bit more meat on, on this and exactly the experience of European providers, I think that uh, uh, the, the presentation of, uh, of Gaffin and Teradway will be uh, will be great additions on this. And Paolo, feel free to add. Yeah, just uh, uh, just you know, to complement that, uh, maybe so far we had uh, probably about seven, eight European companies that actually got involved, uh, different uh, level of, uh, you know, dollars figures. Uh, sometimes, uh, well, sometimes it's always good, you know, to start us with an entry point. And then, you know, of course, it's up to the companies, you know, to develop a uh, future, future, you know, one, one foot in the door, allow me to say. Yeah, yeah. About seven, uh, seven different companies so far from, you know, they're actually, since yeah. the, the end, of course, still going on to the GDA. Uh, and of course, COVID has, um, in some ways, made that much harder. Uh, particularly the foot in the door uh, approach, when people couldn't travel and couldn't uh, um, you know, couldn't follow through. But uh, I guess there were also some opportunities in terms of evaluation, because from the uh, IFI side, uh, they also couldn't go out and monitor projects. So the use of EO became more important in that respect. Yes, that's an interesting angle. Um, uh, usually they do, at least in Adivia, they, they, they always look for earth observation to establish the baseline, you know, that you're very familiar with. So what, what was before the intervention? Uh, Alex, maybe you want to add more things on the World Bank. I know it's a very sensitive subject as well. About the, yeah. So, I mean, for, for European companies, um, let's say that what can I say? What I can say about the the GDA is that, and the O4 is this: that those many of the opportunities that some of those companies got were through the follow ups of those uh, programs, right? So we've been supporting through the O4 is the those companies were put in contact with uh, a specific team at the bank that was implementing a, uh, a project, and then of course they are best positions because they have built this network, and that's exactly linked to the advice I was giving before, which is to build links to project officers because essentially. Um, if you have remember one thing about one of the ideas behind those programs that ESA implements, it's about de-risking the solutions for people in IFIs. Because those people, if they have to do it themselves, they, they wouldn't uh, take the risk of spending their own money if they are not sure that's going to work. So what we're telling them is, look, we're doing it for you. We will show you that it works, and then once you have understood, and once you have understood that this actually works, you guys will do it yourself. But what what happens as a matter of fact is that considering that we recruit EO uh, European companies to do this first step of de-risking it, well then that's those are the companies that are at their reach when they want to follow up and scale this up. Yeah, that's a great entry, Chris. No, I just wanted to compliment actually uh, in terms of the European ecosystem that we are positioning here in the precursor initiatives to, to GDA, specifically EU4SD, but also the related uh, activities like the EU clinic and the EU4SD lab. We have actually 
worked with more than a hundred service providers from our ESA member states, basically from all member states. So in that sense, we have quite a, a strong or, or far reach uh, within the European ecosystem to position these companies. Of course, then they need to build on it, as, as Paolo mm -hmm. said, and we'll try to help them as kind of a facilitator in the middle, trying to translate you know, the requirements so that the, the, the EO supply, in a sense, can meet better the, the demand side. Um, also, one, one should uh, consider the way the ESA programmatic approach has evolved, because initially we did a lot of demonstration activities, right? basically showing the banks that this works, basically was what, what Alex just mentioned. So we have really now progressed further than that, because in a sense, we have demonstrated services across all domains, across all regions, and a lot of these services have been perceived as valuable. So we don't have to keep redemonstrating, repiloting, et cetera. So in that sense, the GDA program is positioned much closer to operations. We call it at the pre-operational stage so that we really position companies to engage with the banks for immediate scale up and, and, and replication and, and operationalization. So in that sense, this positioning for follow-up procurements was of course always in the background but I think now we are getting much more concrete on that side. Uh, and in fact, the GDA 8 center core of the infographic that, uh, that Alex mentioned is kind of the, the dominant engine there, but specifically the activity we will start later on, the, the fast EO co-financing facility will be even a step further in terms of leveraging development finance in direct association to the technical developments we implement using ESA funding. So yeah. Mm. Okay, okay, that's that, that's that's great. Um, we've got a couple of uh, companies who've worked that you've helped that you've worked with the uh, World Bank and ADB. Maybe we can uh, hear from each of them about their their experiences and uh, what they what they learned from the from the process. Alex. Yep. Yeah. So Sharon. Please? Are you connected? Yeah, perfect. Hi, Sharon. I'll let yourself. Oh, you're on mute. Um, I'll let yourself introduce yourself and then just. Okay, so I can say a few words about our experience at GAF. Um, thank you, Alex. So I'm Sharon Gomez, um, head of unit um, at GAF. Um, and I just, I, in a few minutes, sort of illustrate some of the key points that both Alex and Paolo and Chris um, Albrecht have said today. So um, from 2016 to 2020, GUF was leading the EO for SD urban project. Um, and we, we undertook this with a consortium of partners, um, Sears in France and, and our CLS, uh, GSAT in Czech Republic, NEO in Netherlands, um, Union Research Institute in Austria, the German Space Agency, uh, a consulting firm called Aegis from France, and a laterally Caribou Space. Um, in, in the project, we work with three banks, actually, the Latin American Bank, IADB, World Bank, and Asian Development Bank, and supported 32 cities with um, geospatial products in the urban domain. So in just one example, which I can um, uh, raise in this context is that we had, at least with, as GAF, we had an opportunity to work with a World Bank pilot project. And as Alex said, it was part of a feasibility, the feasibility component in the project cycle where they were doing a pilot project in Kigali, Rwanda, where um, the bank, they were working with the city authorities um, bank, the bank requested 3D building height and building footprint data with, to be combined with land cadaster data from the country um, to simulate property value assessments and also to introduce in the country an electronic land billing um, system. Uh, and all this to improve their revenue collection um, from land taxes. So this, we, we provided the data and they successfully implemented the pilot. Um, and important to note from that was that our, with our uh, contact to this particular bank group, this bank group then supported the government of Nigeria in 2020 um, 
with a um, pretty large procurement tender for uh, digital terrain models, digital service models, author photos, 3D um, building height and building footprint data for 36 federal states and for the urban areas in those states and sort of the peri-urban rural areas. And we uh, bid for this tender, it was quite challenging. They wanted it also done in six months. Anyway, we won the tender. And I think just to give you um, an illustration of what uh, Paolo and Alex have said is, thanks to the eo sd we had a direct contact to a group at World Bank um, and the visibility of GUF then also was raised. And this is really challenging for, I, I mean, I think all the European Earth Observation Industry know that if you're not in contact, as Alex said, to the TTLs or um, project leads, um, you're, you're off the radar. And it's, it's um, especially World Bank, the, the knowledge is mostly of American um, service providers. So this, for, for us, this was a good opportunity. It still is, and both EFSD and GDA, I would say, are really good opportunities for us to um, interact with bank teams, get to know bank programs, the bank procurement systems, and raise our visibility to them. So that, that's just my contribution. Okay. Thanks, so that's, that's some good messages uh, there. Um, Paolo, to Alex, I'm not quite sure you want to introduce. Uh... Yes, uh, I just introduce uh, now in a minute, uh, Terra Due will, uh, will share with us their experience. Uh, Terra Due was, uh, was uh, coordinated a winning consortium uh, for, um, for a project in Indonesia. And uh, this project fell under, you know, the component of the space for IDI, uh, which belongs to the banks in a sense that uh, capacity building and skill transfer is on the shoulder of both banks. And, uh, and I'll leave the floor to Terra Due to go into details of what they've done and uh, they were in company and so forth. There was a consortium. The floor is yours. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Mauro Arcoraci. I prepared a few slides uh, to be shown. I don't know if I have the right to share my screen. Probably we, we were a good in slides, Mauro, I think. Okay, okay. So I will keep it short yeah. by saying uh, yes. Okay, no problem. Uh, so. Um, Basically, what I will give you is a very short overview of our capacity building activities held with different partners to support the, the work of the Asian Development Bank in Indonesia. Uh, Teradu is the operator of Ge the, the Geohazard TEP, JEP, and is a platform today counts about uh, 2,400 users from 115 countries. And our team is made by experts uh, with a deep understanding of the JEP uh, thematic application for capacity building and skill transfers. In the last few years, we focus our attention in Indonesia thanks uh, to our contribution to the emergency assistance for rehabilitation and reconstruction in the AO4SD DRR project where in 2018, 19, and 20, we deliver different air products, including the transfer, the transfer of knowledge. This background allowed us to be closely aware of Indonesia challenges from a multi-hazard perspective. As you may already know, ADB and ESA are supporting the government of Indonesia to progress its uh, 2020 and 2024 midterm development plan by bringing access to state-of-the-art uh, earth observation services. You know, services to deal with some of the challenges identified in Indonesia, such as uh, build the resilience to climate and disaster risk, and improve planning and preparation of investment in water resources, agriculture, and aquaculture sectors. So in this regard, the primary objective of the bank is the provision of thematic analysis to facilitate decision taking and planning in uh, their PJM and major projects. Is a leadership in knowledge development through state of the art AO services and the capacity building and skill transfer supported by ADB is helping to address multiple challenges in Indonesia. And today I'll give you, I'll just present briefly the outcomes of uh, this ADB funded project named Support to Water and Food Security Planning and Investment in Indonesia 
through Earth Observation Services. This project covers five pillars about large subsidence, stability of building and infrastructure, flood, agriculture, and aquaculture. Neo services were offered to the user via multiple platforms, which are uh, the JEP, Reticus, and the eDrift WASD platform. This project is led by Terra 2 in partnership with Planet Tech Italia, the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology, and the National Oceanography Center, NOC. And uh, in close collaboration with the Indonesian Remote Sensing Application Research Center of the National Research and Innovation, uh, Innovation Agency, formerly LAPAN. Okay, uh, it's fine. I mean, that's uh, Mauro. I think, we get I think uh, I'm running out of time, so. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. You, Jeff, any we question? Are, we are yes. running a little bit late. Um, okay, okay. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just carry on and hopefully most people will uh, can, can stay with us. Okay. Um, the, the GDA is an ESA program. Um, so it depends on, on the member states. I think it's a subscription program. So not all um, companies were eligible to be part of this due to the, the national participation. Um, I think that's right, Chris, perhaps you can say a few words. And also if there's any um, opportunities to change that, uh, the next ministerial, will there be any uh, additional uh, elements to the GDA? Mm -hmm. Chris? No, that's a good point, yeah. Actually, it refers a little bit also to the programmatic progress that I outlined before. So um, the precursor initiatives, and I'm specifically using the word initiative, um, you know, were basically a budget line, if you will, under a bigger bucket, right? Uh, the envelope, a situation envelope program um, to be concrete. So GDA now is for the first time a programmatic element, a standalone program uh, within the, the, the ESA context. So in that sense, indeed, uh, it was actually proposed at the uh, Ministerial Council meeting back in 2019, and ESA member states had to decide whether or not they uh, participate in the program. We currently have 13 participating states, and uh, you can find out all about that also on the GDA website, which I would encourage you very much to explore, gda.esa.int. Um, and these 13 member states contributed an initial budget of around 30 million euros. Um, so that means in terms of the G-return policy we have in ESA that we can issue and place contracts on the GDA to entity service providers from those 13 participating states right now. Um, in terms of how this continues, it's uh, so that we have again a, a ministerial council here that said, ESA, uh, sorry, the GDA program actually is a five-year program. So it still runs, the current phase runs till end of 2025. So it is not formally on the agenda proposed as a new program this year at the ministerial. However, the ministerial is always an opportunity for member states to join also existing programs or top up their contributions to existing programs, not just to participate in new programs. So in that sense, yes, we, we are actually in discussions with various member states that are interested. We hope that the number of participating states will grow um, as a consequence of the upcoming ministerial next month. Um, we also have indications of uh, some participating states that are already part of GDA for them to increase their subscription level due to uh, good success in the first, uh, first phase of GDA. So in that sense, uh, fingers crossed, uh, I think, the, the GDA program is on a really solid track now and path to growth. Um, I have a few more um, things to, to say, but I think you so just have some things. Uh, just a, me a message there then for, uh, um, obviously for companies or other organizations coming from uh, countries that I, even if they're part of GDA or if they're not part of GDA, you know, talk with your national representatives about increasing or subscribing to the GDA in order to develop more opportunities uh, for working with the IFIs. And exactly, and actually the, the IFIs is, a, is another keyword here. So GDA would not work without the IFIs, right? Yeah. So it's been set up to, uh, you know, in a sense, provide support to the IFIs and increase and facilitate adoption within the IFIs. So GDA also for the first time actually kind of initiated both of our core IFI partners, namely World Bank and ADB, 
to set up their own programmatic structures to complement GDA. So in fact, uh, the World Bank set up a dedicated program called the Digital Earth Partnership Program. So this is the first time such a thing exists. They, they have a team in place, they have seed funding in place, they do fundraising, mobilizing further resources. And ADB, in a, in a similar sense, within their own uh, administrative structure, uh, putting in place an initiative on EO for digital uh, development and transformation. Again, mobilizing resources, trying to coordinate those things within the bank. So I think this is a clear indication that you know, the demand is growing, that the banks take this more serious and also uh, are willing to put down financing. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, you wanted to uh, yeah. add to that? So adding to that, I think that you know, uh, Alex actually mentioned that you know, we are in the process of analyzing both uh, project documents, so that's the graph he showed. Also, we are diving into quite deep into procurement databases of the banks to understand really a baseline of you know, EO-related procurements and how European industry is also positioned there. Um, in addition to that, or complementing that, we have actually launched a, a survey, kind of an industry baseline survey, and I saw that Nikki actually already um, shared the link here in the chat. Um, so that's an, a, a survey dedicated to Canadian and European entities for us to collect a really good baseline understanding of projects, engagements, procurements that European entities have received or that they are working on together with IFIs. So this in a sense looks at it from the other way, right? So we, we screen procurement databases at the sites of the IFIs, but we may miss things here, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are different tags, there are different you know, SAP yeah. codes attached to it, et cetera. It's not straightforward to analyze that. So we also look at it from our side in a sense, asking the EO service sector about their experience engaging with IFIs so that we can create a more coherent picture. So I would certainly very much encourage all of you participating here to this EO Cafe to also um, you know, take those five, uh, seven minutes and fill the survey. It would be really valuable to us and will help us you know, tweak those wheels and, and, and position Europe, Europe even better than, than we've had so far. Thanks, thanks Chris. Um, time, we'll, we'll just carry on. Uh, hopefully uh, some of you can, can stay with us, but I think there's, there are some questions in the chat. Um, the first one came from, well, it was a comment, but it ended up with a, a question. So I'm going to open our uh, Steve to, uh, to come in. I mean, we have, we have to hear from you, Steve. Can, can you hear my uh, audio? Yeah, we hear you very clearly. Okay. Yeah, no, just a comment. Um, it's, uh, I remember an old discussion with the banks that, uh, you know, why should we pay for this information? It's all available free on the internet. And, um, you know, the comment was, um, uh, there's a big health warning with the internet. You know, you may be able to pick up stuff free, but you've no idea of the standards and quality. And this is one of the strengths that um, Europe can offer, both in terms of the service industry and Copernicus. So just my position is, I think you should, you should build that into the messages that you pass, mm -hmm. um, that this sector is, uh, is world leading and uh, you know, it's a professional services industry. Mm -hmm. It's a subject that's, that's been coming back again. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Um, I think Arvin uh, then had a, a question, an interesting question. I mean, yeah, let's... Uh, Arvin, come in and put your question. We'll see what the uh, the experts think. Sure. Yeah, it's probably not directly related to the conversation today, but I was just curious what they think about, uh, you know, what are the best practices and things that they have learned uh, over the years? Because I'm guessing in a lot of ways, uh, the commercial sector thinks similarly to the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank when it comes to using satellite data and starting to use satellite data. So. Perhaps there are some learnings and best practices for the the industry that um, they have, or they can guess they haven't thought about it. Any any views? Actually, before I, I may pass it to Alex or and Paolo also, but we we actually try to incorporate that into the GTA programmatic approach also. So um, we uh, are setting up a dedicated GTA knowledge hub, um, which will have uh, actually three components, but two components address directly what you just said or, or asked for. 
So if one is actually trying to come up with a repository of, of European capabilities, including best practices, examples, etc., in engaging with the banks. So what can we actually offer in terms of services and how has this been taken forward so that the banks can actually tap into this, you know, like what is ready off the market, uh, what still requires some tweaking, you know, the maturity of services. And so, so we'll try to, to integrate that in, uh, in the knowledge hub. Obviously, there is now 10 plus years of experience that we've had from all the piloting, etc. And some of them went well, some didn't go so well. And the reason for these are multifold. The second pillar in the Knowledge Hub is actually focusing less on the technical uh, developments, but more on the capacity building. So we've increasingly seen that, you know, the technical developments alone, they can be great, um, you know, cutting edge, innovative, whatever. But if they're not complemented by associated capacity building efforts and in the long term skills transfer activities, then there is no sustainability to it. So we actually will use the Knowledge Hub also to come up with guidelines for how do you best do EO capacity building in the countries? Because in the GDA approach, we actually expect the banks to do that, to finance it, right? To actually complement what we do and you know train their clients and kind of transfer those skills so that uh, there is also a, a you know, growth of the local digital economies in developing countries. But they are not professionals in doing EO trainings, right? So in a sense, we have done this for a long time and we have also funded it. Now we want them to fund it, but we will still obviously help them to, to do it in, a, in an adequate and proper way. So again, the Knowledge Hub will be a vehicle to, to foster that. So I don't know if I exactly answered your question, but I'm trying to go into that direction. Alex and Paolo, if you want to compliment on some best practices, please come in. Maybe I can quickly comment on this. Um, thanks a lot, Harvin. I, I think that's uh, indeed a very interesting question. So. I think um, I, I can think of four small things um, and trying to be short here. Um, first, commercial, uh, I mean, EO service providers often assume that uh, people they talk to know what they want, and it's not the case. Uh, most of the people that you have in IFI is actually do not really know exactly what they want because they are not aware of the EO capabilities. And so you, you this means that there is a lot of translation to be made and there is potentially also a lot of uh, learning or or try, trying to have a different approach when you when you approach them the second topic would be uncertainty and the link with in situ data for for the the projects and then the the applications that are really worked and that were are sustainable in the long term building links with local stakeholders and making sure that in situ data is integrated for calibration and validation is crucial, right? right? Because you don't want to stop where uh, you have a product, but you don't really know about the uncertainty because you are not able to validate it. And uh, sometimes this happens and then people don't know how to use and proceed on this because the uncertainty is unknown, I would say. Um, third would be how you think about the delivery of the product or the service uh, from the very beginning, it is necessary if you want your if you want to have true adoption and uh, adoption on the long term to think about how the product or the service will be delivered in a sustainable way, uh, and therefore think if it's a service a, a platform who is going to maintain it uh, after uh, after a year, or if it's a product where is it going to be hosted and who will be able to access it? Will there be an API? So I guess those are things that could be obvious for some of your providers. I'm just tagging them uh, because in some cases it, it, it's it's ended up being issues and, and, and obstacles to further adoption and long-term adoption. And the first one is maybe not an obstacle, something that has been an obstacle too much in the past, but I assume that this will be an obstacle in the future for adoption, is that there is currently a shift in the user requirements in terms of business practices. Um, people are really, a lot of people, including in IFIs and on the market, are trying to get away and to move away from uh, proprietary solutions and trying to get basically open source solutions. So a commercial provider would elaborate uh, an analytical pipeline and they would expect him to transfer the Python pipeline or whatever is designed to them so that their own teams, because now a lot of companies have recruited data scientists and, and are, are more staffed than they were 10 years ago, so that they can kind of tweak it. And so this this is hard because this means a shift in the business practices of of, uh, of companies, right? And a change in practices from the delivery of this um, 
all in so that all the solution that that can be uh, used right away to something where you you need to deliver the actual uh, code or or the actual program but then the uh, other follow up activities would be about continue continuing the to, to build on this on this pipeline uh, teaching them capacity building and then continue uh, continuation of the improvement of the pipeline itself and so this calls for a shift in in the business practices um and of course I mean I want to flag this and, and make sure um not to scare everyone that when we think that this is not relevant of course open source should not be applied everywhere right uh, and sometimes people call for it when it should not be actually when it's not the best solution then sometimes we have sim simply to defend the ipr of our companies and make sure that uh people understand that not everything can be open and free right um but just want to flag this because this some this is something that is coming uh strongly in in, in the last year maybe we should have a debate about that in a future uh, eo cafe that's uh, interesting topics there um paolo forgive me i'm gonna i'm gonna skip on to give um people a chance to ask their questions but you know, we'll come back to you in a minute and if you have anything to add to uh, uh to what alex has just said then please add it at that point so um bente um is asking about if there's any links between gda and, and, and geo bente yes thank you jeff Thank you. Very interesting um, presentations and a flashback for my time in GEO when I was working on resource mobilization. And I remember that we were uh, contacting many of the or discussing with the many of the, the same organizations that you presented, Alex, and uh, the World Bank, uh, for instance. And in GEO, uh, we have the GEO work program. ESA is, of course, a participating organization and contribute to many activities in the GEO work program. Now, we were discussing this project uh, approach uh, in GEO. Could we use the projects described in GEO to have a dialogue with the funding uh, organizations, such as the uh, World Bank? Because they are also approaching this from a project uh, perspective. Is there any, have you been thinking about this or is this completely new to you that this would be a possibility or some views on that? Thank you. Right. May I? Yeah, I guess I, I can jump on this one. So no, it's absolutely not new to us, obviously. We are engaging very strongly with GEO um, as ESA, I, I should add. Um, mm -hmm. We've had a lot of interactions also from the side of the eu 4 sd slash GDA kind of programmatic approach. However, I should say that, so first of all, GEO has its own mandates, right? Its own members. The World Bank is a member also, right? ESA is a member. Um, we, as, as a space agency, we are gathering a lot also through the, the space arm of GEO, right? Let's say the CEOs, Community of mm -hmm. Serving Satellites. There is an ad hoc team in CEOs actually focused on the use of EO for the SDGs, where ESA has been playing a prominent role actually through um, colleague Mark Paganini. Mm -hmm. And there we are also kind of sharing our lessons, right, with other entities, including the NASA, JAXA, ISR, whatever. And so we are kind of encouraging others to also push to grow this domain of, of using EO in development finance. However, GEO itself, you mentioned a project-driven approach. Mm -hmm. In fact, we, we don't follow a project-driven approach. We follow actually a program-driven approach. Um, so in a sense, what we try to do with encouraging the work with the banks is we try to influence the whole segment of development finance. Mm -hmm. We don't go there to go for a single donor uh, asking for one particular project. Or we actually, we don't ask donors, right? We actually try to influence development finance. We work with the space budget on our side and we try to use that to leverage development finance. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we, we, we see it increasingly that also, you know, space actors, including GEO, run to, in a sense, development donors, right? ODA agencies, right? The BMSs, the, the DFITs, now FCDOs, et cetera, to, to attract financing for individual activities. We actually feel that, you know, this could be probably streamlined in a sense that, you know, we try to leverage development finance, but actually we let those institutes that implement it do the mobilization, right? So this is a slightly different approach, but um, getting back to your initial question, I mean, obviously on the, on the individual geo uh, initiatives, right? Be it, I don't know, the, the 
for EO for ecosystem accounting, the, the blue, what is it, blue ocean, I don't remember all the acronyms, but the one focused on oceans, the one focused on disasters, right, there is the, 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 the one on the SDGs, right, obviously we are trying to work with all of these and trying to, I mean, the services that are being demonstrated there, of course, have a very similar context in a sense of what we try to push also towards the counterparts in the banks, so we are definitely liaising, but we've so far felt that our approach is a bit different to the mandate and the approach that GEO implements. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Pente. Thanks, Chris. Um, Jeff, are you still with us? Jeff Smith? Uh, yeah, I'm still at the top of my top of my head here. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Hi, right, thanks for a really interesting session. A couple of quite basic questions, really. Um, I, I, I'm an SME from a consultancy. Uh, we're doing earth observation consultancy rather rather than a bigger organization um but we, we've got some uh, service ideas that uh would be de deployed at a regional level uh, and uh alex was mentioning that the funding comes through individual countries uh, and i was wondering how how the funders would think about approaching kind of regional um or well, uh, groups of countries uh to support the sort of development of particular services or, or the deployment of services. So I could answer, but I think Alex, maybe you want to give it a shot. Sure. So there is in fact regional programs. Um, a lot of discussions happen at the country level, but just to cite one, for example, there is the West Africa Coastal Areas Management Program, the WACA program. So there is definitely entry points uh, for regional applications. Um, sometimes those are formulated as programs or even through trust funds. Um, and there, there's different entry points depending on the sector, of course, and the, I would say the geography you're interested in. Uh, so again, the considering how fragmented the base is at the bank, you will need to find, or of course, happy to discuss with you if, or with anybody in this call to, to talk about the structure of the World Bank and potentially uh, help. Uh, but that that's uh, that that would be my main message. Uh, you would, we would need to check for your sector and geography what are the existing regional programs. There is, mm -hmm. but there is indeed. I can confirm that. Yeah. Great. Well, that probably answers my second question. It was just about whether there was a, di a directory of these um, what they, what they called uh, task team leaders or team task leaders. Uh, but I guess we need to approach someone who has the inside knowledge uh, in order to guide us to. Um, yeah the, the right person there yeah yeah exactly <laughs> there is no real directory in itself that you can find on on the internet um and adding a bit of complexity to this um just so that everybody keeps this in mind i was telling you that operations projects can last several years sometimes even six seven eight years but the testing leaders actually move every four years uh there is a kind of a batch match and and uh basically this happens in almost all IFIs that the task team leaders or the project officers move within the institution every four years, which adds another additional layer of complexity for you to engage with them. But you know, it is what it is, and uh, we are trying to navigate uh, this complicated world of the IFIs. I guess we're not going to influence that. Um, yeah, yeah. If I may, you know, like yeah. uh, in terms of uh, regional um, program, you know, in uh, in ADB, you can uh, simply look up in you Karek, know, which is a Central Asia and uh, also Great Mekong region. Uh, it's true that, you know, sometimes you don't find exactly the key person in there, but usually they have a secretariat where, you know, you can post questions and usually they do reply. Okay. Okay. Well, like, thank you, guys. I guess you can help guide us uh, as well. We're really going to have to uh, to wrap up, I'm afraid. Um, it's we've, we've well run over. It's been great. Um, let me um, normally I give everyone a chance to have a last word, but I don't think we can we can do that today. So let me just thank very much uh, Chris, Alex, Paolo, uh, Sharon, and and um, Marco Mauro for for sharing their uh, their views and their their, their knowledge on this uh, on this really interesting uh, program. I hope that uh, more of you can get engaged with it and uh, certainly interested to see the uh, results of the, the survey when those are, are available. Um, our next EO Cafe will also be with ESA. I shan't be in ESA, but uh, we with ESA. So I'm pleased to say we've got uh, Simonetta 
uh, Simonetta Kelly, the new director of uh, Earth Observation Programs, will be, be with us. Um, this is obviously a critical time leading up to the ministerial, so she'll be talking about that and give you the opportunity to ask questions about the ministerial and about the preparations and uh, how, that's, how that's going. So as normal, that will be in two weeks' time. I should be back in my office, with my, uh, in my uh, EO Cafe office. Um, so uh, really hope that you can join us uh, next time. Thank you, everyone who's contributed today. And uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks again Thank also from Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.